If you guys have not already noticed, there's the greatest Royal Rumble on Friday afternoon. Like, we didn't know there's a greatest Royal Rumble on Friday afternoon at King Abdullah Stadium in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Just make sure you guys tune into the WWE Network because the greatest Royal Rumble will be taking place. 11 a.m. pre-show, 12 p.m. bell time, five-hour event, Friday, the greatest Royal Rumble from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, King Abdullah Stadium. If you guys didn't know, I didn't. I didn't know what was going on this Friday. I had no clue. It's like I watched Monday Night Raw and automatically I forgot come Tuesday that the greatest Royal Rumble is happening on Friday afternoon. Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar and seven title matches, a 50-man Royal Rumble. SmackDown Live tonight, man. I, I, I kind of want to take it easy after uh, I triggered many people last night with my Monday Night Raw review. Normally, I'm not like that all the time, but uh, normally when the show is shitty, I, I kind of get a little bit more animated than usual, but I want to take it easy tonight. We want to go over what happened on SmackDown Live. Barely anything for Backlash. I mean, matches were announced for Backlash, but the greatest Royal Rumble is happening on Friday afternoon. I don't know if you guys knew that. I don't know if you guys knew that there was a 50-man Royal Rumble on Friday afternoon. And Roman Reigns was fighting Brock Lesnar for the Universal Championship inside a steel cage. I had no idea. Let's talk about Big Cass, man. He opened the show tonight. Big Cass, back from injury, out seven months with a torn ACL. I will say this about Big Cass, man. Um, I'm not overly excited to see... Big Cass versus Daniel Bryan. Uh, I'm not overly excited to see Big Cass back, period. I I just don't believe yet. And I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because of what I seen tonight. I wasn't overly excited to see him return to SmackDown Live. I wasn't overly excited uh, to see him attack Daniel Bryan. But I knew why they did it. I'm no dummy. Okay, I know my wrestling, I know what I'm watching, and I know why they did what they did with the ending of SmackDown Live last week. If WWE's direction is to get Big Cass heel heat, then you're going to have him attack the most over babyface in the entire company, that is Daniel Bryan. I understood why they do that. At that point, we were all kind of piecing the puzzle together on our own. We were coming up with fantasy situations on our own. Is Big Cass going to align himself with The Miz? The Miz wasn't there last week. He was advertised this week to confront Daniel Bryan. You know, was The Miz hiring Big Cass to do his dirty work while he wasn't there? That type of situation, which, you know, in the back of our minds makes sense because The Miz, Taraj, Axel, and Dallas are on Monday Night Raw, and The Miz was drafted or redrafted to SmackDown Live on his own. And Big Cass would be a very credible muscle to the Miz's act on SmackDown Live. And like I said, if you're going to get heel heat on Big Cass, you know, not only attacking Daniel Bryan, but joining the Miz, that's a dangerous combination for Big Cass. That's a great one-two combination for Big Cass to get himself some heel heat. Now, I don't know if you guys were looking at Big Cass tonight Uh, There's two things that I want to point out about Big Cass. Number one, he reminded me very much so of a young Edge in his facial expressions and his body language. Now, I'm not sure if I want to, you know, compare Big Cass and Edge, but when I looked at Big Cass talking tonight, it reminded me of Edge during his Rated R Superstar day and age. His body language and his facial expressions when he was talking about Daniel Bryan, just how, like how Edge was talking about John Cena back when they were feuding over the WWE Championship, it reminded me of a young Edge. Now, I don't know if you guys seen that, but that's the first thing that I thought of. Number two, I find it very bizarre how WWE has Big Cass come out tonight dressed very nicely in a blue suit. He looks very sharp, 
hair tied back, clean shaven, pulls out the wristwatch, puts the wristwatch on. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, my God, if only WWE would go the route of Roman Reigns with the way they did Big Cass. This is what Roman Reigns needs to do. He needs to come out in the suit and the gold chain and the watch and cut a promo like Big Cass cut tonight. And Big Cass cut a very good promo. And I think Big Cass is going to get better because he is relatively young and there's only upwards and onwards for Big Cass at this stage of his career. If he cut a great promo like he did tonight, and and it was a great promo, he can only get better from here. The one thing I did not understand about the promo that Big Cass cut tonight is that he cut down Daniel Bryan and he attacked Daniel Bryan for reasons that when he looks at Daniel Bryan, Daniel Bryan reminds him of what happened when he was younger. Big Cass wasn't always Big Cass. This is the perception that they're trying to get across to the audience. Big Cass wasn't always seven foot tall. He wasn't always a big guy. He was a short guy like Daniel Bryan who was bullied. There's that word again, bullied. He was bullied in school and he was made fun of and he was picked on and he got his ass kicked. And then he grew and he grew and he grew. And all the kids that used to beat the shit out of him, he returned the favor and beat the shit out of them. Because he was the much larger, uh, you know, person. And he looks at Daniel Bryan throwing his weight around and everybody's all over Daniel Bryan. And Daniel Bryan's making his comeback and he made his return from injury and he came out of retirement. And Daniel Bryan was announced... On the same day that Big Cass was announced to be cleared to return to in-ring competition. They mentioned everything about Daniel Bryan, but when Big Cass was cleared, nobody said anything about Big Cass, and nobody even made mention of Big Cass being cleared. It was always Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan makes him sick. Then Big Cass went on to say that he always lived in the shadow and he's tired and sick and tired of living in the shadow of someone who was a lot smaller. And and this is something that didn't really make any sense to me, man. For most of this guy's wrestling career, especially in the WWE, most of his WWE career, he made a living. He made a paycheck off standing behind someone who was much shorter than he was, Enzo Amore. But then it wasn't a problem. Now all of a sudden it's a problem. Is this the excuse that WWE is giving Big Cass as to why he turned on Enzo Amore to begin with? You know, the reason why we got the turn of Big Cass to a heel to begin with, if you go back to the Enzo Amore days, is because he was tired of carrying Enzo's dead weight. They could have been multi-time champion in WWE as far as the tag team goes, but Enzo could not get the job done and Big Cass was tired of losing because of Enzo Amore. Nothing was said about Big Cass being in the shadow of someone who was a lot smaller or the lot smaller guy, you know, kind of reminding him of where he was growing up. So WWE is pretending like whatever Big Cass said as he turned on Enzo didn't exist and they're creating a new story for Big Cass now. You know, me watching the show and me knowing what's going on and me who doesn't forget about what happened or what I saw on television, it's very difficult for me to invest emotion into Big Cass at this stage with what he cut tonight as far as a promo goes on SmackDown Live. I know what he said previously. And with WWE trying to rewrite the story now, I find it very difficult to believe anything Big Cass is saying today. And that's an issue because I want to like Big Cass. I want to enjoy Big Cass, but I feel like WWE is treating their audience in this instance like they are going through memory loss or whatever happened on television didn't happen eight months ago. I just find it very difficult to care about Big Cass with the excuse that he gave. I'm not excited about a feud with Daniel Bryan. I understand why WWE is doing it. But I don't have to enjoy what WWE is doing. And I don't think anybody really is excited about Big Cass versus Daniel Bryan. Another thing about Big Cass, and this was mentioned by a few people. 
to me, specifically. I feel Big Cass should be the same look, style, you know, body type as what we see with Drew McIntyre. Big Cass really doesn't fit the seven foot giant, you know, like WWE tries to portray him with body fat around his gut the way that he does. He doesn't look intimidating. He doesn't look, you know, as legit as he could be. You know, if Big Cass is going to be built up as SmackDown's big guy, he needs to start looking like, like Drew McIntyre, especially at that height. Maybe he's got to get on the McIntyre diet or the, or the Mahal diet just for a little bit to shed that body fat around his gut. If you're going to look the part, you know, you, you got to look the part. And right now, Big Cass does not look the part at all. That's just me. I might be nitpicking on that one, but uh, it's something that I noticed as well. But these people brought it to my attention, and I wanted to mention it on the show today. And it's something that I wholeheartedly agree with. But as far as the promo goes, it's mostly positive, but again, I find it very difficult to emotionally invest myself in big cast when, you know, we got what we got, and, and this is the way that WWE is going now, like they're trying to rewrite history. I, I want to, but I just find it very difficult for me to actually care. The other thing I want to talk about before we get to the, uh, the one thing that I'm sure everybody's going to want to know my opinion on. The other thing that I want to talk about is the Usos. Now, you're probably wondering what is there to complain about the Usos. Well, there's a lot to complain about the Usos right now. And the inclusion of Naomi in this storyline right now, though it makes sense because she's married to... I don't know, who is it, Jay she's married to? I I don't even know. I, I don't follow... The reality series. I don't watch Total Divas. I don't know who she's married. I think it's Jay. Whatever. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. She's married to one of the Usos. Naomi's inclusion in this storyline does not make the Usos look good. It doesn't. We all remember that we all cried and cried and cried for the Usos to get some type of change to their gimmick. When they were wearing face paint and they were wearing the colorful outfits and they were chanting along with the crowd, ooh, so. We all wanted them to be a little bit more edgy. We didn't really care for the Usos when they were baby faces. Then all of a sudden they come out wearing grills and they come out wearing all black and they come out, you know, all thug and gangster and they have new theme music that's just, you know, very, very... I guess, them to fit their new character. And I loved it. Their attitude was great. The Usos were some of the best promo work on SmackDown Live. During their feud with The New Day, they were some of the best promos on SmackDown Live. The fact that the Usos went from baby faces to what we seen last year really take off and them come into their own was miraculous. And it's something that I absolutely love seeing. The Usos are are one of my favorite acts in all of WWE. And it's becoming less and less and less my favorite act on SmackDown Live and in WWE. For the simple reason of Naomi. When the Usos and the New Day were feuding over the Tag Team Championships, it was over the Tag Team Championships. The New Day didn't do anything to lessen the impact that the Usos had on the tag team division. They didn't make them look weak. The New Day only made the Usos look that much better. And that is a testament to the New Day. And that is a testament to good old-fashioned booking. They made it about the tag team championships. Which team on the brand is the best? And they made it about that. Who is the best and who is the rightful owner of the tag team championships? At the end of that feud, the Usos... Still, in their Uso mode, day one-ish, it took a lot for them to slightly break the gimmick or the character that they were trying to portray on television to own up to the New Day and shake Kofi, Xavier, and Big E's hand at the end of that feud. But they did it, and they didn't lose a step in their character or their gimmick. It fit their gimmick It fit their character, and it fit their storyline. 
They didn't stray from what they were trying to do with the Usos. Now, all of a sudden, with the Bludgeon Brothers, the WWE is making the Usos the much more inferior team for the Bludgeon Brothers. And that's not the way to go. WWE is humanizing the Usos to a point where the Usos, I'm afraid, one of these days, the WWE is going to turn them back into the good old goody two-shoe goody Usos with the colorful outfits and the face paint. I, I don't want that. I don't want to see the Usos that we've seen on the Mixed Match Challenge. I don't want to see, you know, Naomi interacting with her husband like she did on the Mixed Match Challenge. That was a thing for Facebook Live. It had nothing to do with storyline. Now that you're including Naomi in this storyline, you're actually harming the Usos gimmick and the character that they're trying to portray on SmackDown Live. The Usos have lost their edge. The Usos aren't intimidating anymore. It's like they've taken several steps back from what we've seen in 2017. For the sake of what? For the sake of what? The Usos, back in 2017, would have never stood for what the Bludgeon Brothers are doing. Now, all of a sudden, they're relying and they're okay with Naomi getting involved when the Usos in 2017 were ready and willing and able to fucking lock you up and beat the shit out of you in the Uso Penitentiary. Now we're relying on Naomi to care for her husband and show sympathy for her husband. I don't want to see that. I want to see the Usos get in the ring, cut a promo on Luke Harper and Eric Rowan, and I want to see and hear the Usos tell them that they're going to go into the Uso Penitentiary, that it's not paranoia. What happened to that? The only paranoia that I have is that Naomi is humanizing the Usos in this storyline. It's not something that I want to see. They need to get the Usos back on track because whatever they did tonight, I'm not a fan of whatsoever. So please, WWE, whatever you're doing with the Usos, this is a vastly different Usos team compared to what we've seen when they were feuding with the New Day inside Hell in a Cell. And I'm not, I'm not for it at all. The other thing that I want to talk about here is Shinsuke Nakamura. Again, I am no dummy. I understand why WWE did it. And you're probably wondering, if you didn't see SmackDown Live, JD, what are you talking about? WWE added lyrics to Shinsuke Nakamura's theme, kept the, the, the beat, they, they kept the violin part, I guess, but they added some, like, rock guitar with some Japanese lyrics over it, and everybody's flipping out over this. I understand why WWE changed Shinsuke Nakamura's theme music, believe me, okay? I, I'm not coming on here. This is no amateur. I'm not, I'm not some fucking amateur. I've been watching WWE for 30 years. I know why they did it. It fits the gimmick of what Nakamura is doing. Okay, he, he's low blow Nakamura, or what Solomon says, nutcracker Nakamura, right? I understand it. I completely understand it. Nakamura is not going to be a heel for the rest of his WWE career. He's a heel right now because WWE brought over heels to SmackDown Live. You got Almas coming in, you got Joe coming in. And Nakamura would be a, a good offset to those guys, right? You got Styles, you got Orton, you got Jeff Hardy. It, it's a nice, it, it's a nice mixture of heels and faces on SmackDown Live. I get it. Nakamura's not going to be a heel for the rest of his WWE career, and when he turns babyface, that music is going to be returning, the one that we love so much. You know, Rising Sun. It's going to come back, and when you hear that original theme music again, when Nakamura turns babyface, the pop is going to be big, people would have missed it, and people are going to embrace it like it was day one and we first heard it down in NXT. I understand it. I have been very, very positive about what we've seen with Nakamura as a heel. I think with the three weeks that we've seen, and the fact that he's been sarcastic, he's been unforgiving, He's had fun with it. You know, you roll that up into one big ball, and I think it's working right now very well for Nakamura. And I hope to see it succeed, and I hope to see him eventually win the WWE Championship under this new gimmick, under this new attitude. I, I really hope so. 
I understand why they did it, but my logic is to everybody, and I want to I wanna make sure you guys understand where I'm coming from. And, and this is a very subjective thing, and I'm not here to sway anybody's opinion on it. I'm not here to down anybody's opinion on it. I want you guys to understand where I'm coming from. Theme music is the last thing you have to worry about when you're talking about making a heel. You know, the theme music isn't a top priority. It's all in how the guy is portrayed and how the guy is booked. Okay? The theme music is the least of your worries. And I I look back to NXT and I look at Bobby Roode down in NXT. When Bobby Roode made his initial debut for NXT, we heard the theme music. Within weeks... It was the hottest theme song in all of WWE. Right next to Nakamura's, I think it's the most viewed video or music video theme song on WWE Music's YouTube channel. Glorious was amazing. Bobby Roode, at his time at the top in NXT, and I mean as NXT champion, when he was feuding with Nakamura and he was feuding with uh, Roderick Strong, Bobby Roode, in that current state, in that time, was not only the best heel in NXT, but he was the best heel in WWE. The way he portrayed himself, the character that was Bobby Roode when the music was not playing, was a heel. People loved the theme music, and people loved the theme music and grew to love the character Bobby Roode. Bobby Roode maintained a number one heel status in WWE with the most over-themed song in the entire company. So there's no reason to take Shinsuke Nakamura's theme music, change it, make it much more inferior to a point tonight where it barely got any reaction whatsoever. And And I think that's the reaction that people gave it tonight because they didn't know what the fuck was going on. They didn't know what they were hearing and they're just gonna have to get accustomed to it in the following weeks to come. But... I am a proponent of, or an advocate of, if it's not broken, do not fix it. And I'm going to stick by what I'm saying here tonight. Nakamura's theme song was not broken. Nakamura's theme song does not make, you know, him any less of a heel. Nakamura is going to be a heel regardless when he gets in the ring with AJ Styles after the attitude that he's shown AJ Styles. Nakamura is going to be a heel when he gets in the ring with a Daniel Bryan. The theme song is not really going to matter. Keep the theme song the way it is. Why change it? You didn't change it for Bobby Roode. So why would you change it for Nakamura? Bobby Roode still maintained being one of the best heels in all of WWE, if not WWE, with that same theme song. They didn't change his theme song. Now, when they turned him babyface, it didn't work. And it has nothing to do with the theme song. Vince McMahon's logic was, we're going to turn Bobby Roode babyface because he has an overly babyface theme. And it backfired on them. Bobby Roode's character was perfect coming out of NXT. It was perfect upon joining SmackDown Live. They changed him from heel to babyface and it ruined his character. It had nothing to do with the theme song. Vince McMahon thought it was all the theme song. Oh, he's... Got everybody singing along to the theme song, that means he's a babyface. No. No, it doesn't need to be that way. That's my logic. If Bobby Roode could be the best heel in WWE with the most over theme song in the company, why would you ever think about changing Shinsuke Nakamura's theme? I get why they did it. It fits the no speaker English, and it fits his heel character. It fits the nutcracker Nakamura, you know, scenario that they got going on. And then when he turns babyface again, whenever that time comes, the original theme is going to come back and it's going to be over. But my logic is, if Rude didn't need it, and he was the very best at what he was doing, then Nakamura doesn't need it. That's my logic. That's my state of mind. That's my thought about that. I don't want to sit here and put anybody else's opinion down because that's not what I want to do. But a lot of people misinterpret what I say as overly negative. And I at least want to give you a reason as to why I'm thinking what I'm thinking with what I said tonight on Twitter with Nakamura's theme song being fucking terrible 
and not needing a change. That's exactly what I meant. What I told you here tonight is exactly what I meant. Simple as that. Simple as that. We're going to end that discussion right there. Those are the main thoughts on SmackDown Live. Nothing else really happened. Did you guys know that there's a Royal Rumble on Friday afternoon? I'm not sure if you knew. There's a greatest Royal Rumble, 50-man Royal Rumble in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia at King Abdullah Stadium on Friday, 11 a.m. pre-show, 12 p.m. bell time, Roman versus Lesnar inside the steel cage. I'm not sure if you guys knew. Big event on Friday. Going to be epic. Just want to make sure you guys know. SmackDown Live. Show opened up with Miz TV. And Daniel Bryan was supposed to be the Miz's guest on Miz TV. Well, apparently, Daniel Bryan didn't come out. And Big Cass ended up being the Miz's new guest on Miz TV. Now is the moment that the world has been waiting for. My guest tonight is a man who just last week threatened to punch me in the face. He is a man who wants to get his hands on me so bad he can taste it. And quite frankly, I'm surprised. You know, just under a month ago, I welcomed my daughter Monroe Sky into existence. And from that moment, all the anger and bitterness that I had towards Daniel Bryan, it all melted away. You know, I'm surprised that Daniel Bryan didn't feel the same way when Bertie was born. You know, maybe they don't have the same bond as Monroe and I, but you know, Daniel and I, we have a lot in You can common. kind of We're see that fathers. when they begin He's that storyline, that it's gonna the gonna, they're going to kind of spread the lines of reality, Ms. And Mrs. which I hope so. Network. It's going to make for a better storyline. You all are going to watch it whether you boo me or not. You know, Daniel Bryan and I were both masterful in-ring technicians. But the one difference that we have is when I became a father, I knew I had to change. And I am a changed man. I'm a better man. So, Daniel Bryan, if you want to come out here and still punch me in the face, then come on out here and punch me in the face. Well, looks like you don't have a guest, so I'm your guest now. Interview me. Go ahead. Take a seat. Well... I was supposed to be interviewing Daniel Bryan. Well, nobody cares about Daniel Bryan. Oh, he had a career-threatening injury. He might have never made it back to WWE. Well, I was on the shelf nursing an ACL injury for seven months. And I worked 24-7 to get back here as soon as possible. And the day that I get cleared, guess who also gets cleared? Daniel Bryan. If you're out here to try to help me with Daniel Bryan, I don't need your help. Despite what you think, Miz, not everything in this world is about you. For me, I, I know what it's like to be a Daniel Bryan. Up until the age of 16, I was a little guy. I was small, I was pathetic, I was weak. I know what it's like to be Daniel Bryan, and guess what? It sucks! I got beaten, I got bullied, I got pushed around, until one day, I got real sick and tired of getting pushed around. And I started to grow, and I grew and I grew and I grew to be seven feet tall. And when I got to be seven feet tall, I went back to everybody that pushed me around and I beat the hell out of them. 
and they deserved every beating they got just like I deserved every beating I got when I was a little guy. Daniel Bryan reminds me of myself when I was a little guy and I despise him. I'm gonna make sure Daniel Bryan goes back to where he belongs. On the shelf, beaten, batter, bruised, and retired. And he will never, never cast a shadow over me or anybody else again. Yes, yes, yes. You got to give it to him, man. It was a decent promo. Uh, another side note here on Big Cast, man, is his theme music fucking that bad? I don't know what they were going for for his theme music, but... This is the second theme song that they gave him as far as him being a singles guy goes. The first one, I don't even remember what it was, but I knew it was god-awful. This one is not that much better at all. They need to go back to the drawing board and they need to give this guy some serious big man music because whatever they got going on there, it does not fit big cast whatsoever. Talk about theme music. His theme music needs to go, and he needs something that's going to fit his character a little bit better. But Big Cass carried himself well. You know, he was very well-spoken. He looked great. I just can't find it in myself enough to care about the explanation he gave about Daniel Bryan. And the fact that Backlash is literally a week away. You know, WWE is booking this match of Backlash between Big Cass and Daniel Bryan. Doesn't really give me... You know, anything outside of what we heard tonight and then one more SmackDown before Backlash to care about this feud. So, WWE has a lot of work to do if they make me, or if they want me to care about Big Cass and Daniel Bryan at Backlash. Very good, though, by Big Cass. You got to give him credit. Let me know if you guys seen what I seen as far as Big Cass and him reminding, re reminding you of a young edge during the Rated R Superstar days. We seen the women, of course, and what else? A tag team match on SmackDown Live. Did you expect anything else? Asuka and Becky Lynch versus the Iconics. Now, I don't, I don't want to put down Billy, Billy Kay and Peyton Royce. Bill, uh, Billy Kay and Peyton Royce were actually very entertaining in NXT, but they were not this overbearing and they were not this annoying. You know, I think they have to tone it down a little bit. I think WWE is ramping them up a little bit on the main roster, and it's just kind of reaching its cringe levels. They were never like that in NXT, and I didn't feel like that about them in NXT, and I know you guys are feeling the same way about that. Peyton, Royce, and Billy Kay talk about how good they look on the big screen. More Peyton Royce instead of Billy Kay. Billy Kay is not my type. But they mock Becky Lynch and Asuka. They break down how they are better than Asuka and call her the Empress of Yesterday because she is no longer undefeated. They go on about being the future of WWE until Becky Lynch makes her way down to the ring and Asuka makes her SmackDown Live in-ring debut. The Iconics get a win here. Becky tags in for a double-team hip toss. Asuka with a running kick to the nose. Becky with a leg drop. Billy goes back. Off the apron, Becky bumps into Asuka and knocks her off the apron accidentally. Becky unloads on Peyton Royce now, looking for the win. Becky fights off Peyton and Billy Kay now. This leads to Peyton Royce rolling Becky up and putting her feet on the ropes while Asuka is on the outside, preoccupied with Billy Kay. And Peyton Royce gets the cheap victory here over Becky Lynch and Asuka as the Iconics win their first match on SmackDown Live. They needed a win. They needed a win. After last week, you know, and, you know, I believe it was Billy Kay taking the loss. They, they needed a win here. And they got it in, you know, the same way that I would have booked it. Becky Lynch taking the pin. Asuka not taking the pin because I would not have Asuka take another pinfall for the rest of the year after losing to Charlotte at WrestleMania. We don't need that anymore. Asuka needs to be built up or at least begin the recovery process for being built back up to where she was. At least enough to get to another title shot and then finally reclaiming the title. Because you know the next time Asuka fights for the title, she's taking the title. That's just the way it goes. 
But Billy Kay and Peyton Royce get a much-needed win here in typical heel fashion. Feet on the ropes, Peyton Royce pins Becky Lynch. Other than that, really nothing else to the match whatsoever. Renee Young is backstage. Outside of SmackDown, Commissioner Shane McMahon's office. WWE Champion AJ Styles comes walking out, and he's all smiles. AJ says Shane just gave him the chance to soften up Nakamura before Friday's big match at the Greatest Royal Rumble, because I'm not sure if you guys know there's the Greatest Royal Rumble taking place on Friday. 50-man Royal Rumble. AJ versus Nakamura for the WWE Championship. We got seven title matches. Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns inside a steel cage for the Universal Championship from King Abdullah Stadium in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia on Friday. Friday afternoon. I'm not sure if you guys know it. It's happening this week. So AJ says that Shane gave him a match with Nakamura and Rusev Day tonight. And as far as his tag team partners go, well, I'll tell you what, Renee, it's going to be too sweet. That's all that AJ Styles said as he walked off. The Usos are backstage talking when Naomi comes out of nowhere. Jay Uso leaves. Jimmy, now she's married to Jimmy. Jimmy's the one that she's married to. Jimmy Uso wants his wife to promise she won't come out and get involved in tonight's match like she did last week. Naomi says she looked at the Bludgeon Brothers directly in the eyes and saw nothing. She knows this is her life with Jimmy, but she has a bad feeling this time. She asks him to stop playing and be serious. Jimmy tries to calm her down and says that he's going to take care of Rowan tonight and then take back the SmackDown Tag Team titles on Friday in Saudi Arabia at King Abdullah Stadium in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. I'm not sure if you guys know, man. This huge event's going on Friday. The greatest Royal Rumble on the WWE Network. You gotta be there, bro. You gotta be there. Rowan versus Jimmy Uso. This one was relatively short, man. Jimmy Uso wins. And I didn't care for this whatsoever, man. I thought this was absolutely cringe. I hate shit like this. But WWE does it, and they continue to do it. Now, Uso ends up here. uh, He gets thrown into the barricade uh, fairly brutally here by by Rowan. Rowan beat the shit out of him in a running cross body block, threw him into the barricade. Um, Rowan yells out. He's beating the shit out of Jimmy, brings Jimmy back into the ring. Um, All of a sudden... We get Naomi's music going off. Naomi's music's going off, and and she does the full entrance as if she's coming down to wrestle her own match. And all of a sudden, she stops mid-aisle, and she does that stripper dance that she does, and she bends over, and she starts shaking her ass, and Luke Harper is looking on as if he's standing in the strip club waiting to pull out dollar bills to start flinging them at Naomi. He's just standing there. So, Harper and Rowan are staring at Naomi's ass as she's dancing on the ramp. Jay attacks Harper from behind, sends him into the steel steps. Jimmy takes advantage in the ring with a super kick, and he rolls up Rowan for the pin because Naomi was shaking her ass on the the, the, the entrance ramp. I didn't like that at all, man. I really didn't like that at all. Naomi, what she should have did is run down the aisle get on the apron, and shake her ass on the apron. We didn't need the whole entrance. We didn't need the whole light, glow, fucking bullshit effect of the entrance. Why is that? Why are you going to make, in the middle of a match, the whole arena is going to go dark and you're going to have some fucking light show going on? Come on, man. That's absolutely ridiculous. You know how stupid that looks when you look back at it? You got Jimmy Uso and Rowan fighting a match Right before their tag team match on Friday, and Naomi's making her way down to the ring as if she's having her own match with a full-blown entrance. Arena goes dark in the middle of your match. I don't like that at all, man. You know, it's better in a situation where less is more. Naomi should have just ran down the aisle, you know? She should have ran down the aisle with a steel chair and hit Harper in the back with a steel chair, took him out, jump on the apron, shake your ass, Have Rowan be distracted at Naomi's nice ass. Super kick to the face, one, two, three, it's all over. We didn't need the theme music. We didn't need the light show. Less is more. Attention to detail. Talk about less is more, man. My goodness. Carmella 
Carmella, another one that I just don't have any emotional investment in. Renee Young is in the ring for a contract signing. She plugs the SmackDown women's title match at Backlash on May 6th and calls out Carmella first. Apparently, it's supposed to be Charlotte and Carmella sitting down together. You know how these contract signings go. So, Renee introduces Carmella, but she complains about disrespect. She says, what is this? Why is it that the women's champion is announced first before the challenger? This is something that WWE had Carmella scripted to say. Meanwhile, they are the most blatant fucking, you know, culprits of this. You know how many times WWE has sent out the champion first during a title match over the challenger? Now they're having Carmella complain about it. Why don't you practice what you preach here? The challenger should always come out first, no matter who it is. The champion is always introduced last. It's an old school mentality. But they have her complain about it here. I wish WWE would actually practice, like I said, what they preach. She says this isn't Flair Kingdom any any longer. And it belongs to her now. Carmella says she has something to address before Renee gets all boring. Carmella says that she's the champion. And more importantly, she's the champion of everyone in the crowd. She's the champion for Renee Young. She's the champion of the people here in the arena. They boo her and she starts firing back. She goes on about last week's cringe melebration. And says because she's champ and makes the rules around here now. That she's going to play the same highlight reel again, but this time when it's over, people will be standing and show her the respect that that she deserves. So we get this same video package that we got last week, played in full, of her winning the money in the bank and her cashing in, and people start booing, because that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to boo. Carmella's a heel. She took the championship off the babyface Charlotte, and they want to voice their displeasure. So... Carmella, in typical heel fashion, she goes to play the video package again for a second time in a row tonight. And she says, let's let's do it right this time. You're going to stand and give me a standing ovation, the respect I deserve. So as soon as they start it, Charlotte's music hits and she comes out. So she sits down. Charlotte sits down, stares at Carmella. She takes a seat. And she signs the contract. She signs the contract. Renee asks her asks her to be professional and takes a seat, but Carmella raises the title and wastes her time. She finally sits down across from Charlotte. And Renee says it's time to make the title match official. Flair signs the contract first, smirks at Carmella. Flair throws one of her signature woo chants at Carmella after signing, and they have a few words while standing up to face off. Uh, together, and Carmella is going to raise the title. It appears she did not sign the contract. This quickly led to Flair slamming Carmella's face into the table and then throwing the table on top of Carmella. So that's the way the contract signing ended. Two things here about this contract signing. Number one, um, I already told you that I'm not emotionally invested in Carmella. I I think Carmella at this stage is nothing more than the transitional champion. I appreciate the fact that it looks like Carmella is getting legitimate, real, genuine heel heat for the way she's coming off, but it's not really doing the title any favors. You know, it's it's more like she's treating the title as a joke, and she's highlighting everything else around the title, naming it after, uh, I don't know, what did she name it? What, what did she name it? Medusa or, or something like that? I don't know what the fuck she named it. Cleopatra, you know, she's talking about the video package and give me praise and respect me and this and that. What are we respecting you for? WWE highlights the fact that she held the Money in the Bank briefcase for 289 days. Is that some fucking type of accolade that we got to start celebrating now? Great, you held it for 289 days. Okay. I held, uh, well, well, I got, uh, I don't know, I got this action figure sitting on my fucking wall opposite of me. For six years. Do I deserve some fucking accolade that it's still in its box? All pristine looking? 
Who gives a shit? You held the briefcase for 289 days. You picked the right opportunity to cash in your briefcase. Why? You made a smart decision. It's not something that we have to highlight you for. The way she's coming off is like more of an embarrassment to the title than anything. Just look at how Charlotte held the title. Look at how Carmella is holding the title. It's like Carmella isn't being taken seriously by anybody. And I don't take her seriously now to begin with anyway because she's not that good in the ring. She's not good in the ring at all. She doesn't exude champion. She may play a decent heel and she's getting genuine heel heat. Fine. You're doing one aspect of your job correctly. You come off well in your promos. You're doing one job of your aspect correctly. But I'm not emotionally invested in what Carmella is trying to portray. That's what I'm saying. I hope she loses the title at Backlash. I want to see Charlotte win the title back. Because the real money program is building towards Charlotte and Asuka too. And the real program is Asuka winning the title, getting her revenge from Charlotte. And the real program is Asuka having the title come Survivor Series. And we get Ember Moon to win the title on Monday Night Raw. And we get Ember Moon and Asuka 3 at Survivor Series. SmackDown versus Raw. And then we get Charlotte winning the Royal Rumble. And then we get Charlotte challenging Ronda Rousey, who's going to take the Raw Women's Championship from whomever the champion is going into WrestleMania. That's what I think is going to happen. That's how I book it anyway. But yes, Oscar versus Ember Moon, three at Survivor Series, wherever that may be. Where is that? In Los Angeles this year or Houston? I don't fucking know. Whatever. You guys get my point. That's what I do. Carmella is not a character right now that you're emotionally investing your time in. And they show that highlight package. Whatever she's wearing now... It might look sexy, but again, I don't take her seriously wearing that. She looks like she's wearing, I, I don't know what the fuck. She, it looks like she's going to the fucking gym. What, the, what is that? It's not wrestling attire to me. What she was wearing when she won the Money in the Bank actually made her stand out. It actually, it actually made her look unique. It actually fit her gimmick a little bit more. The sweatpants and, you know, the, the, the Carmella logo on, on, on the chest. The tank top. She looked like the, the, the princess of Staten Island. I don't know what the fuck she looks like now. But whatever, man. Carmella is carrying herself well. She's just not legitimate. And she's not even at that level yet. And I hope Charlotte takes the title from her at Backlash. Because Charlotte with the title to build towards another match with Asuka is the money program for SmackDown Live going into the summer. Simple as that. I didn't care for this whatsoever. She's just keeping the title warm for another Charlotte title reign. Randy Orton versus Shelton Benjamin. This was actually a decent match, man. We got Randy Orton, Shelton Benjamin, and Jeff Hardy, a la 2008, fighting over the United States Championship. Shelton Benjamin won here, and it was due to outside interference. Jeff Hardy was sitting on the outside, but Jeff Hardy didn't interfere in this match. Why, why should he? He's the babyface. Babyfaces don't interfere in the match against uh, uh, Randy Orton and Shelton Benjamin. Why would he? He's just there to scout his, uh, his opponents or scout his opponent or a possible future opponent, Shelton Benjamin. Orton is going for the RKO. Shelton is recovering, rolls to the floor to separate some space. Orton follows, slams Shelton's face onto the announce table right in front of Jeff Hardy. Orton looks like he might toss Shelton towards Jeff, which would have been very generic. But Jeff stands up and tells him to hold on. Jeff watches as Orton slams Shelton on top of the announce table Orton brings it back into the ring, and then all of a sudden we see this small, tiny man wearing a red Mexican mask run around ringside. He takes out Jeff's knee, and then he runs into the ring. Orton unmasks the man, and it ends up being Sunil Singh. So Sunil Singh was there on behalf of the modern-day failure, Jinder Mahal, and he gives Sunil Singh an RKO because... Jinder Mahal, obviously, is fighting Jeff Hardy for the United States Championship. At the greatest Royal Rumble, which I don't know if you guys knew, is happening on Friday. The United States Championship is being defended at the greatest Royal Rumble in King Abdullah Stadium in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, this Friday on the WWE Network. Did you guys know that? I didn't. I didn't know at all. Anyway, he gives... Sunil Singh does Orton, the RKO. This leads to Orton turning around and eating 
Shelton's finishing move, the pay dirt. Shelton Benjamin covers Randy Orton for the pin. And he pins Randy Orton on SmackDown Live. So what does this mean? In typical SmackDown fashion, I hope it doesn't happen because I would much rather see a one-on-one -on -one match with Jeff Hardy versus Randy Orton for the United States Championship. And Shelton Benjamin then gets a match against whomever the champion is. But in typical SmackDown fashion, I feel like now that Shelton Benjamin pinned Randy Orton, he pinned the number one contender, at Backlash, they got to throw it in there because it wouldn't be a WWE pay-per-view without one. Triple threat match, Hardy, Orton, Benjamin, United States Championship, possibly at Backlash. Look for it. I hope I'm wrong. I'd rather see Hardy versus Orton at Backlash for the United States Championship. New Day is backstage doing what they do best, cringe. They got a table filled with glasses of bootios, and they got pancakes littered around, you know. Then all of a sudden, the bar walks in, interrupts. Sheamus and Cesaro assure that the New Day uh, won't see them on SmackDown Live after tonight because they're winning the vacant Raw Tag Team titles on Friday in Saudi Arabia. I don't know if you guys know. This major event is happening in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia for the Raw Tag Team titles, man. Matt Hardy and Bray Wyatt are going up against the bar at the greatest Royal Rumble for the Raw Tag Team Championships. Did you guys know that? So they want to move back over to Raw because uh, they want to win the tag team titles and become, I guess, five-time tag team champions. They each grab a pancake and leave. We have Daniel Bryan with Renee Young outside the trainer's room. Apparently, he was attacked. He was attacked by Big Cass. That's why he didn't make his appearance on Miz TV. Bryan comes out and says that the doctors are just taking precautions and he will be ready for the 50-man Royal Rumble in Saudi Arabia. I, again, I, I, I did not know. I did not know that Daniel Bryan was going to be in this 50-man Royal Rumble. And he's back, and it's going to be a great night, he says. Bryan reveals that SmackDown General Manager Page has granted him a match against Big Cass at Backlash. Page was not on the show tonight. Bryan says he will use the momentum for Friday's Rumble match to take care of Cass and show him that everyone is the same size when they're on the mat tapping out. We got a backstage video of Samoa Joe. Joe's talking about winning the Intercontinental title on Friday and then watching Roman Reigns get massacred by Brock Lesnar on Friday night. I wish, I hope, I pray. Joe says if Reigns somehow survives and wins the Universal title, then he will take that title at Backlash. You can believe that. And we hear fans chanting for Joe in the arena. Andrade Cien Almas had a nice video package about him coming soon to SmackDown Live. Very nice. Very nice. Can't wait to see, wait, can't wait to see Zelina Vega and Andrade Cien Almas on SmackDown Live. AJ Styles, Luke Gallows, and Carl Anderson versus Rusev Day and Shinsuke Nakamura, man. This was, uh, you know, a very, very short main event. Uh, here we had Nakamura, Rusev, and Aiden English win. Um, the heel team of Nakamura, Rusev, and Aiden English keeping control over the match for most of it until Gallows comes in, uh, gets the hot tag, unloads on English, Gallows with a two count on Rusev, uh, or actually on English as Rusev breaks it up. Everyone in this match gets involved, it starts breaking down in typical six-man tag fashion. This leads to Nakamura, with all the confusion going on, hitting a Kinshasa on Gallows, for the pin, after the bell, the winners are announced, but AJ immediately hits the ring and attacks Nakamura. They go brawling. They tangle up until Nakamura nails another low blow on AJ. Nakamura waits for AJ to get up for the Kinshasa. Nakamura charges, but Anderson runs in and pulls a Johnny Gargano. Uh, he pulls a Johnny Gargano here. He sacrificed himself for AJ as he took the Kinshasa on behalf of a... J. Styles. Nakamura nails Anderson with a, another Kinshasa. And AJ watches on and he can't do anything about it. So that's that, man. And SmackDown goes off the air. The thing with AJ is, man, they're doing the title match on Friday. Um, it might look like we might not be getting a WWE Championship match on Backlash when it happens. Being that we're happening where we're getting it on Friday. So, WWE might be going down the path where 
You know, one world title is defended and the other is not on Backlash to make way for a, a mid-card or upper-level mid-card feud, upper-mid-main-event upper, upper mid main event kind match, you know, to be in uh, inserted into that Backlash card. So we might not get AJ Styles defending the WWE Championship because he's doing it in, on Friday in Saudi Arabia. We might just be getting the Universal Championship defended at Backlash against Samoa Joe as he goes one-on-one with Roman Reigns. So WWE, like I said, may be going down that path where they kind of take turns with the titles being defended every pay-per-view because it would be overload. You know, you can't feature everything, and you should not feature everything on these dual-branded shows anymore. So for SmackDown Live, we got the U.S. title. We got right now Jeff Hardy versus Randy Orton, Charlotte versus Carmella, and Big Cass versus Daniel Bryan. So that is SmackDown Live right now, and then I don't know what else they're going to add. So for, for Backlash on Raw side, um, I don't know what they have outside of Alexa Bliss and Nia Jax. And then Roman versus Joe is announced, but we don't know if it's going to be for the title or not. And then we got The Miz versus Seth Rollins. Now, I don't know if you want to consider that the one mixed match that really isn't a part of any brand. But apparently The Miz is getting his rematch at Backlash because he invoked his rematch clause and WWE sticking to it. I wish for the sake of the brand split that they wouldn't give The Miz his shot at all because he's not on Monday Night Raw anymore. I wish they find a new opponent for Seth Rollins. But Backlash right now, I will have a better understanding of where the card is come Monday at the end of Raw and going into SmackDown on Tuesday. Hopefully it's fleshed out, but Backlash, the way it's looking, is one of those throwaway shows because WWE's putting everything into the Greatest Roman Rumble on Friday afternoon, which I will probably be doing a quick 20-minute uh, video tomorrow just going over the preview and predictions. I'll give you my thoughts on the Royal Rumble, who I think is going to win the matches on Friday, who I think is going to win the 50-man Rumble, what I hope to see out of it, etc., etc. Thank you guys so much for everything, man. That's your SmackDown Live review. If you guys missed, I did live stream on YouTube around 5 o'clock. We played Chapter 1 of The New God of War 4 for PS4. So if you guys want to go check that out, great episode so far to start the series off. It's live on the channel right now. Good to go. Go check it out. Show some support. Thumbs it up. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. And hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for notifications. And I will see you guys tomorrow for a little off the script extra, man, as we talk the greatest Royal Rumble this Friday from Saudi Arabia preview and predictions. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you then. Have a good night. I'll talk to you later.